this piece. Having listened to the piece myself and knowing what environmental aspects were bringing about the composition of it, I have to say that it reminded me of a quote I heard from a professor of mine a long time ago. It was something along the lines of, extraordinary circumstances creating art makes that art significant in itself and that art will always be extraordinary. I think that quote fits this piece quite well. At this time, I would like to thank some of the organizations and individuals who have made this possible. There have been many organizations and individuals that have made this event tonight possible, but I'd like to focus on a small handful since uh, I'd like to uh, keep the program moving. I'd like to thank the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the American Library Association, and of course, our team here at UH West Oahu, who were the boots on the ground and did a lot of the legwork on this event, Alfie Garcia, Karina Cherneski, Michiko Joseph, and our professor of music, John Magnuson. Thank you. I'd like to welcome our next speaker, which is Lieutenant Governor Josh Green. Josh Green is a local physician, husband, and father of two, and currently serves as our 14th Lieutenant Governor and was elected in 2018. He currently serves as our COVID-19 liaison since the advent of the pandemic. And this is the point that I found most interesting in his bio. He continues to serve as an emergency room physician twice monthly on weekends on Hawaii Island. And having spoken to the Lieutenant Governor before this event, I found it especially interesting that he said, that service helps keeps him sane. <laughs> With that in mind, please welcome our Lieutenant Governor, Josh Green. I'm a Polish Jew, and that means that I grew up with, in the 1970s and 80s, with many relatives that had survived the Holocaust. My mom came from Russia, a generation before uh, my father and his, his father uh, from Poland, from the Carpathian Mountains, and uh, they smuggled. They smuggled to survive during that period. And so when we reflect on what happened and what the American experience with the Holocaust uh, was, and still is, we reflect on the lives of our own family members that have shared some of their stories with us. When my father uh, started his uh, young life in Pittsburgh with a, uh, with a grandfather, with a patriarch that was deeply committed uh, to justice, he became the only Jew in his community. And so every uh, time there was a school presentation, every time there was a, a, a lecture to be given, he was the one that was called on, very intelligent man, my, my dad and my grandfather. And he then told the stories of what my grandfather, Sam Green, did. First thing he did when he came from Poland uh, at age 10 was changed his name. He changed his name from Yoshua uh, to Sam because they couldn't pronounce Yoshua. Uh, so he became Sam Joshua Green. And uh, almost exactly 100 years later, my son was born, and we named him Samuel Green. And so the tradition is to not forget, to not forget uh, the stories of the loved ones that we have that struggled to survive during the Holocaust. And it's this American history and this extraordinary presentation upstairs and the music that we'll hear. These will be new memories for us. Uh, my grandfather went on to bring 300 relatives from Poland and across Lithuania to the family firm. My grandfather, though he never graduated from college, became a wealthy man by uh, running a big engineering firm. But it actually meant the survival of hundreds of relatives that he brought over over the course of uh, World War II and built up the family 
and then more came and more came. Some escaped to Lithuania, to Hungary, uh, from Germany, from Russia, but they did survive. And then as I grew up, I got to know these relatives like Rachama Rachkowskis, who had come from Lithuania, a very wealthy uh, Jewish woman, extended member of our family who gave everything up to come to America and to share her story. And I remember uh, crawling under the piano, watching her play the piano when I was six and seven years old and looking up and for the first time could see the number on her arm, under her blouse. So it were those memories that I, I formed as a young man and why I was so happy to see a young woman here, a beautiful third grader who's with her parents who are helping her understand what it means. And we're here because we have to remember. And as the years went by, uh, I spent time with Rachama and Hutzkul Rushkowskis, and they uh, would always tell me the stories of what they had gone through, how they met in the camps, how they had their first child in the camps. I stole schnapps that, that Hutzkul made, which would knock you on your butt. One tiny <laughs> thimble when I became a, a teenager. And when I uh, got ready for college, Rachama would tell me the stories of how they survived the camps, and then would, of course, begin to add, you should definitely marry a nice Jewish woman when you come back from college. <laughs> so I endured uh, that and the schnapps and the stories over the many years. But all in all, as we see what the world may or may not do across Europe with, uh, with Russia and the Ukraine, where there remains to be seen uh, how many people will suffer, some will be Jews, some will uh, be other individuals that are uh, put into great peril because of their beliefs. We have to be there for them. We'll have to be ready uh, to help others and to see the world through this. But for our part, we'll remember the great history lessons of America, I hope. And I hope that tonight will be one of those nights. So again, thank you for welcoming me. Sorry for being a bit emotional. I'm remembering a lot of different things from my childhood. Uh, but I'm personally grateful to have been a third generation um, individual who, because of some great bravery and, and incredible challenges overcome, got to come and live a life in America and to serve the way I get to serve you as a doctor or a lieutenant governor. So I'm grateful, and I'm grateful to see so many people here to remember. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for the welcoming remarks to, from Ken Anoye and from uh, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green. Thank you so much. It was really moving for me, so I really appreciate that. And I don't know how I got the short straw to go after Lieutenant Gover Governor, but <laughs> here I am. Um, I'm, I'm just so honored to be here today. Mahalo to Karina Cherniski and to Elfie Garcia for inviting me here today to share my words about the importance of libraries in our community. So I had the opportunity to walk upstairs two weeks ago to look at, to experience the exhibit, The Americans and the Holocaust, and I learned that there were two purposes for this exhibit. They were asking us two questions. The first, what did Americans know during the Holocaust? And the second, what more could have been done? And I was equally horrified and yet strangely accepting of the two facts that yes, Americans did know. There was news being reported regionally and nationally, and yet, there was a general resistance to changing those circumstances based on this knowledge. That on the one hand, 94% of Americans did not approve of how the Nazis were treating the Jews, especially in the aftermath of Kristallnacht. But then a week later, 71% of the Americans said, no, we don't want the refugees coming into our country. No, we don't want people who are escaping persecution to come into our borders. So I'm so thankful to the exhibit curators and the librarians and the researchers who did the work for this very important project. Because the fact is, is that Americans did know. Now there's no way those 1930s Americans could have predicted that the hatred they were witnessing abroad would transform and become the systemic genocide of over six million people. But here we are in the 21st century and we can look back and we can see with our future eyes that that is the case that in our libraries and our archives are the written words, the recorded words, the transcripts, the official government documents and the letters and the memos and the policies. There are mementos of people being brave, standing up against this hatred. 
and there are also artifacts of anti-Semitic hatred and hatred's words. And together, they tell the story in part upstairs. So it's the importance of libraries to work with our communities to tell at times these very difficult truths about our past because they open up doors to our present and our future. Our libraries are more than this beautiful building or the books or the chairs, which are really wonderful things, don't get me wrong, they are beautiful. But what really comes to life in libraries are ideas, our truths, our stories, and are about making the invisible visible. Even today, there are Holocaust deniers on the one hand, and on the other hand, there are Americans like myself, maybe the younger version of myself because the older version of myself is a little cynical, but the younger version of myself was like, there was no way, we were a big world power. If we had only known, we would have intervened, we would have made a difference, we would have done something. But what if I told you, or maybe you already know, that the very laws that the Nazi Germans put forward to persecute the Jewish citizenry in their country, to strip them of their civil rights and their humanity, were laws that were based in the United States, specifically the codifications in the southern states. I'm getting emotional too. <laughs> Remember, this is the era of Jim Crow. Segregation was alive and well, and the intermingling of black and white were not only reviled, but it was illegal. Racial murders were being perpetrated regularly, and the perpetrators were not only getting away with it, but pictures of the atrocities were printed on postcards, circulated as souvenirs through the United States Postal Office. Now, as a good librarian, I will cite my source, a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author. Her name is Isabel Wilkerson. She published a book in 2020, and the title is called Cast, The Origin of Our Discontent. It's available, actually, in your library. I read the Kindle version. But it has an extensive bibliography of the facts that I'm sharing with you today, including the fact that when the Nazi Germans put forward their Nuremberg Laws in 1935, they themselves recognized that they didn't go as extreme as the laws in the United States. So let me circle back on the importance of libraries in our community and our role in access to information and access to justice, and that we're more than the books and the computers that are wonderful, but we are safe spaces in our community where we can celebrate story time with our kids. I love story time but we can also do the research and the work to examine the very difficult truths about our past, our lives, and our country. And we can come together and support each other in the pursuit of knowledge of anything that we're humanly interested in. People say that the United States is in more conflict now or more polarized now than ever, but when you walk up those stairs and you see the placards, America first, Maybe it's not so much that we're more polarized than ever. Maybe the volume is just turned up. Or maybe we continue to grapple with the difficulties and the challenges, with the darkness and the light of what it means to be human. And in the library, we do not shy away from this. We don't shy away from these conversations and the facts and the truths. We turn the lights on. And when the United States Holocaust Museum puts out a call for their project, the libraries turn over over 15,000 news artifacts, articles that were non-digital to shed light on what did Americans know during the Holocaust. So today, what more can we do? What more can libraries do? What more can library guests do? What more can library patrons do? We can keep turning the lights on. We can keep telling these stories with each other. We can keep that pursuit of knowledge. So let me close with a quick story. It is the springtime, 2015, Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore is engulfed in smoke, and there's glass shattered all over the streets. Protests had erupted at the death of Freddie Gray in police custody that was later ruled a homicide. Protests that were peaceful at first, but had erupted into violence. One woman, her name was Carla Hayden, and she was the director of the public libraries in Baltimore. And she made the decision to keep her libraries open, specifically the library that was in the epicenter of the violence. She served her community. Her libraries became beacons and safe havens for her community, for her community, serving her community, even amidst all of this turmoil. And today, Carla Hayden is the Librarian of Congress 
the leader of librarians, I couldn't be more happier that the leader of libraries is someone who chose to keep the lights on. And I'm so thankful to the James and Abigail Campbell Library who are doing the same, who brought Americans in the Holocaust here to shed lights on the stories, to help us remember, to remind us we are more than the misdeeds of our past. And if we keep our minds and our hearts open, we can and we can create a better present and a better future. So please join me in keeping the lights on. Thank you. Wow. I got the short stick. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out for this event. My name is John Magnuson. I'm uh, faculty here. I teach music. I'm the only one on this campus that teaches music. And I, I just want to give another shout out to our librarians, because this is where music happens for our community. It's in the library. We don't have a concert hall on this campus. And so I just want to thank Karina, Alfie and Mitch and all of the other the 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 other staff uh, and support that that makes events like this happen. I just want to talk a little bit about the role of music at a prison camp, and then in this piece in particular. Um, the prisoners came from. I've got a lot of plosives. Maybe I should put my mask back on. <laughs> the, can you hear me? Is that okay? So, uh, um, thanks, Doc. Okay, <laughs> I'll take. So, so the quartet that originally premiered this piece uh, were um, were from different backgrounds. They didn't know each other before ending up at this prison camp. Messia, actually, he was captured in uh, May of 1940. And he was about 31 years old, a little bit older than the other musicians. The uh, Messia was the pianist in the performance. And, um, and they had a I'm, I'm going to read a little bit from this book. For the end of time, the story of the Messian Quartet, uh, courtesy of our great Jim Moffat. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca Riskin is the author. The musicians of the quartet represented a wide range of religious, philosophical, and political views. At the center of this musical circle was Messian, whose quartet inspired all but whose religious convictions his colleagues did not share. Around Messiaen, the devout Catholic, revolved Pasquier, raised Catholic but ideologically agnostic, Le Boulard, also raised Catholic, he was the violinist, but staunchly atheist by his own admission, and finally, Akoka, the secular Jew and ardent Trots Trotskyist, Yet these four men shared a musical mission that united them and spawned a friendship that transcended their differences. And if you think about music, and the, especially the music that you're gonna hear now, it doesn't have words. It allows you to connect to sound in a way that, um, that each one of you will come away with a different perspective on the music. Uh, I, was, I was talking to my friend Seth over here uh, earlier, and um, he bought the album when he was 11, right Seth? Yeah, and, um, and, and yet, you know, his comment was, huh, you know, Messia, I see all that, great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think, you know, it, it bears asking when we um, when we dedicate 50 minutes of our lives to listen together as a community to music in silence. 
that's that's an investment and and I, I want to say that regardless of how that music sounds, the fact is we're all taking it in together. And, and in a space like this, I like to call it a little Carnegie Hall, <laughs> uh, it, it will shock you at times, it will puzzle you, it will um, make you feel like you're rising into the clouds at times. There will be many, many different kinds of feelings from this music. Messiaen was a, a, an ardent bird lover. He would go out and, and listen to the birds and write down what they sang, like musical notes, and then the, those notes would find their way into his, uh, into his music. At times, you'll hear those birds, and at times you'll hear some very martial sounds, some, um, some very ardent sounds. Uh, what, uh, what you might be puzzled by are the harmonies. And I, without totally geeking out, because I love, I love this kind of, um, you know, Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, they drew their melodies from major and minor scales. And a, an example would be, um, in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transition over to the piano just for a bit, John, if you...
free time. Altogether, we may. So, Mr. Nye. 